The day I landed in Vietnam, I knew this was going to be a tough thing. My main goal was just to return back to my cot every night without a scar on me. I turned around, I, I took a couple of steps when somebody further up tripped a bouncing Betty landmine. And all of a sudden, two rockets whizzed by me. And I just remember just being knocked to the ground. I think I realized I could be an athlete again a year or two after the point of injury. I think that sports is a huge factor in speeding up the recovery of a person with disability. It gave me a, another outlook on life that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. I never felt like in my life I ever slowed down a whole lot. It just kept going. My name is Danielle Green Bird. My rank was a specialist. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Back in 1984, I think when we had the recession, my mother started to abusing drugs. I believe she was into cocaine, marijuana, and um, crack cocaine. I knew at the age of seven that something was wrong, but I didn't quite understand. So I used to go to my grandmother to ask her, well, what is my mother doing? And my grandmother would explain it to me. So I grew up just playing a lot of basketball in the streets of Chicago, anywhere I could play basketball. In high school, I just really excelled. I had a successful four-year career playing basketball, playing volleyball. I ran track and played softball. And I was a part of JRTC, so I was really well-rounded because I knew that's what I needed to do in order to get into the University of Notre Dame. After I left Notre Dame in 2000, I did get a tryout with the Detroit Shock, and I made it all the way to the final cut, and um, I didn't make it. So after that, I returned back home um, to no job, because I hadn't, I hadn't done an adequate job planning at the Notre Dame. You have to understand, Notre Dame was the be-all, end-all. So I decided to go talk to a recruiter, and I felt like the Army was a perfect mix. That was just what I was looking for. And I knew when I was signing on the dotted line that the war was about to jump off. But my thinking was just because you have an, a degree does not mean that you're suited to lead troops into battle. And so I didn't want that type of responsibility at the beginning. So that was my thought process in enlisting instead of coming in commission. The 571st MP Company arrived in theater, Baghdad, Iraq, January 23rd, 2004. Our mission was basically to train the Iraqi police officers. I was scared. I remember being scared. that I, I was so scared that I went to talk to a psychiatrist. My main goal was just to return back to my cot every night um, without a scar on me. May 25th, 2004 was a very, very um, long day. We had to go to the police station. And this is a police station that we were accustomed to going to every day or whenever we were on call. So eventually it was my turn to go to the two-story up to, up to the rooftop to pull security. So I'm up there for about 15, 20 minutes and all of a sudden two rockets whizzed by me. As I was about to take cover, um, the rocket or something, I'll say something, hit me. And I just remember just being knocked to the ground. I woke up maybe a couple of hours later, but all I could see was the whole chain of command standing at the foot of the bed crying, and I couldn't understand why they were crying. I said, what are you guys crying for? I'm still alive. So then I looked down, and I saw all these bandages, and then that's the first time I realized that my arm was missing. And I remember just that evening closing with everyone leaving, and I was scared. I was scared because this was the first time in theater that I did not have a weapon. So if the hospital was to be under attack, I had no way to um, defend myself. So I just went to sleep, um, just scared. And that's how May 25th, 2004 ended. 
Uh, I grew up in uh, Oak Park, Illinois. It's on the west side of Chicago. It's a west suburb. And my first interest in sports came with uh, the sport of swimming. And then I think it was in my junior year of high school that I really began to excel in sports with the long jump and the high hurdles and led me on to the University of Arkansas where I became a three-time All-American in track. So I really started considering the military for two reasons. One, uh, my wife and I were just getting married and I had no job. <laughs> and the second reason was uh, I wanted to continue to run track and field. I thought that I really had a good opportunity to make either uh, the 1992 or 1996 Olympic Games. And the United States Army had a program, the United States Army's World Class Athlete Program. I went to the All-Army Track and Field Camp and actually qualify for the Army's world-class athlete program out of that camp. And I fully expected to go and have served my three years as a soldier athlete in order to make or try to make uh, an Olympic team. But what happened was Saddam Hussein raised his ugly head and uh, I was diverted to uh, a field artillery unit and wound up uh, spending seven months in the desert. Our unit really became very close-knit uh, because you have to have uh, y your buddies back uh, in, in battle and you have to trust your training. I think that you also find that there are, are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, folks do a lot of praying when they're, when they're in the desert and, and, and the bullets start, start uh, whizzing by. So here I am, this, this, uh, this world-class athlete that gets uh, derailed in my dreams and, and serves in the Operation Desert, Shield Desert Storm. I come back literally unscathed and on May 17th, 1994, I go across a hurdle while I'm training for the World Class Athlete Program again and then my left leg hyperextends, severing the popliteal artery and subsequently ending my Olympic dreams for good. Growing up here in Washington State was absolutely great because we're close to the ocean, we're close to the mountains, uh, we have kind of a little bit of everything to do. I love sports. I love to ski. Went to high school and played football and those um, actually had a, a scholarship to a junior college at Yakima YBC to play football. I was in Sun Valley, Idaho in 1967 and I called home and I got a draft notice from my uh, from the government saying I needed to come in and, and go into the military. The day I landed in Vietnam, I knew that this was, this was going to be a tough thing. It was always scary. I mean, I never at one moment of that time in Vietnam ever felt like I wasn't afraid. June 29th, we had our whole company working together. We set up a... Um, an LZ, a landing zone for the helicopter to come in. And because we were out in the field for 30 days at a time, they would have to bring us supplies and ammunition. I had sent a couple of the guys up after the helicopter. And they were all 20 feet away from me. And I thought, well, I better run up there too. I need to ask a couple of questions on what we're going to do tomorrow. I turned around, I, I took a couple of steps. When somebody further up, tripped a bouncing Betty landmine. It was so strong that it killed four guys and wounded 12, and, and, and I was one of them. They carried me into the tent, into the hospital tent there, and I went inside there and I went unconscious. I woke up in Yokohama, Japan, and looked at the end of the bed, and what you see is, is what happened to me. I remember talking to Master Sergeant Harrelson, and she said, you know what your comrades did against company commander's order? And I said, what? They, and she said, they retrieved your rings. I said, you're kidding me. And these are the rings that I have on today. She said, they went up to the rooftop, and um, they found your, sand, your hand under seven inches of sand. And what do you want me to do with these two rings? And I said, well, you know, put them on my right hand. I still have one hand. So the decision that I had to come up with, what the doctor gave me, he gave me two options. He said, we've cleaned out a lot of your uh, leg, your gastrocnemius muscle and your ankle, uh, and you're gonna be left pretty much with a fused foot uh, and use a walker or a wheelchair to get around with your mobility, or you can take option number two, which is an amputation. 
And I normally like to describe myself as resilient. So for me, it was just a matter of bouncing back, you know, staying true to myself. I couldn't um, allow a missing arm to affect who I was as a person. The best option for me really was I wanted to be mobile and the, and the artificial leg was going to help me be mobile. So the, the decision was pretty easy for me to make. Uh, and it was just time for life to uh, move on. When I woke up in Japan, I got better really quick. And my brother's wife had a friend that was in the military, a very high ranking officer, and they came out and picked me up and drove all over Japan. I remember driving all over Japan and back to, and again, my legs were still open with bandages on them. I just felt like, heck, this is great. I'm, you know, I'm out doing things. So I never, I never felt like in my life I ever slowed down a whole lot. It just kept going. So when I returned home from Walter Reed Medical Center, uh, I was offered a position with the Chicago Board of Education in their sports administration department as a citywide sports coordinator. And now I'm at Malcolm X College and I'm really able to share my experiences with college kids because I've already been where they're trying to get. Malcolm X Junior College is a two-year college, so my goal is to prepare them for four-year colleges and hopefully to find them scholarships so they can go to school for free, just like I did. I have several different um, activity arms and adapted devices. I have one where I can cycle. I have a bike that's specially made uh, for my disability where the brakes are just on one side, so I do do some cycling on the side. I have a new arm that I just picked up about two weeks ago, which I'm very excited about. It's a jump rope arm. So I'm really excited about that because that's another way I, that I can try to stay fit. I'm gonna try to do a triple jump here. Oh, yeah. um, the pleasure that I get out of practicing or playing golf is um, the competitive nature of it. You don't necessarily have to compete against someone. You can compete against yourself. Ah. When I play golf, I actually feel like I have two hands again. So it almost makes me feel whole. Sports will always have a place in my heart because of the seven-year-old. The seven-year-old kid is always in the back of my head. And so it just puts a, a, a big smile on my face and it just gave me another outlook on life. I think I realized I could be an athlete again uh, sometime probably about a, a year or two after the point of injury. I had separated from service, uh, med medically retired, and that's when I first heard about the Paralympic Games. All this swimming that I was doing for physical therapy, I was getting faster and faster in the water and I wound up going to the Paralympic swim trials and actually making the Paralympic team and competed in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm, on, I'm watching closed circuit television from the swim venue. And as I'm watching closed circuit television, I'm watching track and field go off and I've never seen an amputee above the knee like myself running leg over leg uh, down a long jump runway. And then it's, I said to myself, why am I not out there on the track and field running when I've done this for the better part of my life where I know what this sport is all about? Why am I in this swimming pool? And that was the beginning of the process for me to have an artificial leg made for running. As an athlete, I was in the Atlanta Games in 1996 and in Sydney, Australia in 2000 and won the silver medal in Sydney. And then in 2004, I, became an, I was an administrator with the United States Olympic Committee, U.S. Paralympics Division, and went to the, the, uh, the Athens Games, went to Torino in, in 2006, and then went to uh, Beijing, China in 2008 as an administrator. Part of my job is working with the VA and uh, trying to provide support at the Winter Sports Clinic or the National Veterans Summer Games and really trying to make sure that veterans understand the opportunities that they have 
So the injury opened up a lot of doors and, and now I'm in a position to where I can actually give back and help other people's dreams and aspirations towards the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games be achieved. After I lost my legs, I just wanted, this just sounds so corny, I want people to know that I am just like anybody else. I can do whatever, whatever I want to do and whatever I set my mind to. I think I have this, like, I'm going to do it. Don't, don't help me. <laughs> There's not a lot to do when you're a bilateral above amputee. I mean, you can do weights and things like that, and you go to the gym. But what happened was there was a group of guys, and I'd heard about uh, wheelchair basketball. When I came home from my uh, first basketball practice, my hands were completely covered with blisters. But man, when you can't even close your hands or open your hands, and then I go back to another practice, I've got tape all over my hands, and it was just incredible. It's, it was so much fun. How I segued into the road racing and the way that fit was that road racing started becoming really, really popular in the mid-70s. And I thought, well, wow, this is great, you know. So I got, got involved with that, and it just it took over. I'd go out and I'd do 20 mile rides, I'd do 15 mile rides on, on my racing chair and I'd worked and worked and worked. I'd probably done 100 marathons in my life and, and what an opportunity to meet great runners, stand up people, other wheelchair athletes, travel all over the world, travel to Europe, to Asia, and, and just would never thought that that would ever happen in my life. Yeah, in, in 1981 I won the Boston Marathon and that was just incredible. It was uh, uh, one of those experiences you've worked so hard for. And I'll tell you, uh, coming in there first place and there's 100,000 people standing in there screaming and yelling and the hair in the back of your neck is standing straight up and the tears are kind of running down your cheeks. And yeah, I've won other races. I've won the you know, won Honolulu Marathon. I've won Seattle Marathon. I've won Sacramento Marathon, I've, you know, all over. But that, that was the first big race and that was a huge, huge moment in my life and it it just kind of you know takes you to the next step yeah this is where I started everything right here I had a whole bunch of ideas and uh, wanted to come up with different products to make so persons with disabilities could really do things when I started uh, magic emotion which is the name of the company uh, we we wanted to take it to do every single product we could possibly do and the wheelchairs back then weighed about 55 pounds. And a friend of mine and myself came up with this little baby. Now obviously all the wheels are gone on it, but what you see is you see a lightweight aluminum frame. That dropped the weight of that wheelchair from 55 to 24 pounds. It actually won the Boston Marathon in that frame. And then we went to this frame. Look at the difference. This is, this is the evolution of that wheelchair. That wheelchair went from a little square box aluminum frame with a whole bunch of rules to a frame that the total weight with the wheels and everything is 15 pounds, 15 pounds. The mono ski was developed by myself and Jamie McCormick here in Washington State. We wanted it to be able to be so you could be self sufficient, get on the chairlift, get off the chairlift, you can ski by yourself, you can do everything by yourself. You know, really that's what it's all about, is, is being able to get back out there and do whatever I did before and, and uh, just maybe do it a little bit differently. Man, I tell you, it, it's, you can't even imagine how great it is for somebody that hasn't not been able to ski for uh, 20 years and now being able to go back up there and do it. I, I never looked back. I think that sports is a huge factor in speeding up the recovery of a person with disability. 
you know, when I was in Chicago growing up, sports always gave me an outlet. With this injury, it just told me that, you know, my life is, is not over. You have to some way get your brain away from what I used to have to what I have now. My father and I, we try to take the word accident out of the injury because was it an accident or was it actually fate that happened? Because when I look back on it now and I see all the things that have transpired in my life, if that didn't happen, these other things may not have happened. I'm not sure what my life would have been like had, had I not uh, lost my legs. I, I absolutely know I wouldn't have traveled all over the world, but I, I just, I can't imagine ever doing the things I've done. It's just, it's, the opportunities have been huge, incredible. My father was, was right when he, when he said that, you know, this is something that's going to impact a lot of people. So just keep your head up and keep your faith. You will find that uh, there will be a lot of opportunities here, not just only for yourself, but you will have opportunities come for other people that are coming behind you that have these difficult situations. The VA is so far ahead of everybody else, it's scary. More hand cycles, more wheelchairs, bikes, basketball chairs. Try everything. Try it, try it, try it. I guarantee you'll like it. It gave me a, another outlook on life that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. You can still do whatever you want to do. You just have to do it differently. So do it.